would like to acknowledge uh, the country that we are on today. Uh, I acknowledge and pay respects uh, to the tr traditional owners and elders, past, present, of the land on which we stand today. Uh, the Jabikai, Irigenji, and the Jamoi, uh, Yudinji people. I would like to welcome everyone too who have come from uh, all around Australia, our delegates um, from colleges, our, uh, our members, associate members, students, and uh, and our brothers and sisters from over, overseas, New Zealand. David, how are you, And um, and uh, and welcome. Uh, I think um, some of our, um, our people from overseas have been here before, so. Uh, another um, EDA and Aboriginal business, so that's in Torres Strait Islander business. Now we went through some housekeeping yesterday uh, in regards to where the toilets are, and emergency exits at the hallway, toilets up the end of the hallway, the exits are uh, big signs at the hallway as well near the um, stands. Um, also remind people to have their phones on silence turned off, but we do encourage people to use um, social media and um, um, also the, the, the hashtag for the, uh, the social media for um, Twitter and that I think it is, I don't use it but most of our members do, it's uh, hashtag Aida Cans. and if anyone has any recommendations or comments there's um, stand outside that you can uh, with the uh, near the AEDA stand, you can um, write down your comments or any feedback there as well. Right. And for the students, can I just ask for the students, uh, um, AEDA students, just to sign in before you come in and also to see Heidi outside the door at the stand so all the students together afterwards and we'd like to have a group photo uh, for our sponsors and that today. And just encourage and remind people to turn up to these events. The pool's not going anywhere. It'll be there after at the end of the day. <laughs> Believe it or not, I did turn up to a lot of things in the past when I was a student. And um, just to you know, respect our, um, our speakers who have come you know, a long way to, um, we only meet once a year, so just to pay that respect for them as well. Now, be I think that's about it for housekeeping, so I'll introduce the speakers today. Um, our first presentation is, uh, uh, about, is it up already? No, yeah. Who clicks on that? So, so that will come up, it's uh, Ideas Van. So our first um, two speakers are uh, uh, Miss Lindell uh, DeMarco and uh, Dr Christopher, or Chris Rollerbaker. Um, Lindor DeMarco is the CEO of the Ideas Van and Executive Director of Diamond Jubilee Partnerships Limited. Lindor spearheaded the creation of the Ideas Van model when a $5 million donation became available from the Queensland Health to address uh, avoidable blindness in Indigenous patients with diabetes. Lindor has a background in inter international uh, humanitarian, humanitarian sorry, causes um, and has been instrumental in implementing programs that benefit communities in 27 countries. A key focus of her work has been the engagement of the corporate world as a uh, force for good. She has continued this work in Australia with the Ideas Van project and by engaging in its supporting partnerships with an innovative and collaborative approach to corporate responsibility. The Ideas Van is a state of the Art Mobile uh, Treatment Centre which travels throughout our back of Queensland where volunteer, volunteer doctors fly in remote locations bringing gold standard treatment at no cost to the patient. 21 partners have joined the Ideas Initiative uh, to cr create this model, a world first, uh, which is now expanding across Australia. So you'll be coming up first and I'll introduce Chris after this. And before you start your presentation, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sean White, I'm, I'm a Barkindji Kamilaroi person. My people are from New South Wales, of, uh, central, uh, east west New South Wales near Tamworth, and um, uh, western New South Wales, or Kenya, Barkindji, Darling River region, where my mother's people are from. 
Um, currently a GP registrar working in uh, Ngunnawal country at Wananga Nimija Aboriginal Medical Service. Um, I, I've been, in, I've been only in that place for about uh, uh, three months or so. Prior to that I was working uh, in the general practice at Yuriyungi Aboriginal Med Medical Service in the Kimberleys at Balls Creek. I was up there with a colleague, uh, another med uh, Aboriginal doctor, so it was quite unique and rare to have two Aboriginal doctors in one small location and uh, it, was, it was good to work up there. I was up there for 10 months or so and prior to that I was working um, in Orange, New South Wales in private uh, uh, general practice, one year of psychiatry and I done my internship by, and resident year in Orange uh, Hospital as well. I also, um, I, my graduation was through um, uh, Newcastle University. Um, so thanks for waiting. <laughs> for um, that acknowledgement of the country and uh, thank you for inviting us uh, today. Uh, you probably haven't heard of the Ideas Van because we've kept ourselves under the, the radar a bit. With any good idea there's always opposition. Any unique idea there's always opposition and there's no tougher opposition from the health world. And but so we we took it upon ourselves to, to do a film uh, to do a film at the end of last year, and so this is a good idea that worked. We can 
uh, reduce the number who need to be seen to a, a smaller group of people. I can just see the second line, D, M, X, O, P, and the rest, the other two, I, no. Nah. Do you find your eyes get very gritty and red? Mm. Yeah? Ideas Van parks right outside the Aboriginal Medical Service, wherever it is, to allow patients access to world-class ophthalmic services in a culturally safe environment. The real strength of it is that we've got it there in Mount Isa on a regular basis and meeting the real needs of Aboriginal older people. Oh yeah, there, there, D and O. Good. The Ideas Van consists of three treatment rooms. On board, we have an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and an ophthalmic assistant. I mean, the big driver here when it comes to preventing blindness, which is what we're really working on, is you know improving patient compliance. And the easiest way of improving patient compliance is to make it easy for patients. After seeing the optometrist on the Ideas Van, they move through to see the ophthalmologist for treatment. When would the would the last injection have been in the last couple of months? Yeah, they'll be on the fifteenth of this month. I've got a background in Indigenous ophthalmology, but also in diabetes, and there's been some great advances in diabetes with intravitreal injections in the last five years. No injections, no laser, you normally lose vision. But with the injections on your left side, we can improve the vision. So you reach the criteria to need injections on the left side. Mm -hmm. On the right side, we benefit from some laser. Okay, this is about the second, maybe the third time since it's been here, maybe the second time, I'm pretty sure, I've been here on the van, yeah. We can do everything on the van except cataract surgery, and that includes the three commonest causes of uh, poor vision and diabetes, which is refractive change, we can prescribe glasses, uh, cataract, we can prepare the patient for surgery with special measurements, and finally we can manage the diabetic retinopathy. The Ideas Van is equipped with the latest technology, a city ophthalmic practice on wheels. Complementing this world-class service, the van is fully connected and includes a live clinical grade telehealth system allowing instant communication with a major Queensland hospital in emergency. So we're, we're putting the focus on diabetes and it's not just ophthalmology, it's also endocrinology and telehealth because diabetes is a systemic vascular disease that affects the whole body. We can treat the eyes, but there's also not only treating, but we need to prevent the eye disease. And that means addressing the diabetes and the diabetes control. So it's the beacon, gets in there, gets the interest, alerts people to the fact that diabetes is important, and it can identify patients who have very poor glycemic control. And then we can be in the background and actually come in via the video conferencing and actually deliver the appropriate diabetes care in conjunction with their usual GP. Previously, when I've worked in Indigenous ophthalmology, if you don't like you, we're delivering a, a third world service in a first world country. And so now we're, we're bringing the best standard of care equipment uh, to the Indigenous communities. The Ideas Van travels to far north Queensland, as far as Normanton, as west as Mount Isa and as south as Warwick, we even travel over the water to beautiful Palm Island. This is a community which has multiple medical problems. The Ideas Van just allows us to give more support that we can to some of the sickest people. That's, that's amazing. It's amazing that we can bring that sort of care to the remoteness of Palm Island and, the, and to the beauty of Palm Island. And to, and to the beauty of these people on Palm Island. We can make things as easy as possible for Aboriginal people so that we can get them like a full service in their own Aboriginal health service where they're most comfortable anyway. Then they're most likely to turn up, they're most likely to take care of their eyes, they're most likely to get the treatment they need, and they're less likely to go blind. And I appreciate the fact that this service is here, it comes to us and we can manage our health. So it's all about family, Aboriginal culture is about family and it's about looking after each other and by being able to see, we're able to care.
especially our community control health services who completely make it work. Their commitment and their partnership uh, is, is as important to the van as are the doctors that uh, treat the patients. So now we, uh, one of our favourite doctors is Dr Chris Rallabaker. He, uh, he helps us on the van and uh, Chris uh, will be the, the next person. Um, we'll save um, questions until the end of the, um, all the presenters have uh, done their presentations and we'll have you seated up here and uh, we'll get questions from the floor. Okay, our well, next speaker is uh, Dr Chris Rallabaker. Uh, he's a proud descendant of the Yagura, uh, Burugubba, <laughs> Duru, Ramju peoples on his mother's side and the Rotary people on his father's side. I apologise if I didn't pronounce that right, brother. After completing Year 12 in Brisbane, uh, Dr Chris Rollebaker entered medical school at the University of Newcastle. And in 1997 was a founding member, member of the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association. He undertook his internship at the Gold Coast Hospital in 2003 and then his resi residency year at the Princess um, Alexandra, uh, the PA hospital uh, in Queensland. Seeking to broaden his uh, experience, Chris then moved across to uh, develop and manage the Indigenous Health Unit in the Logan Bay Desert Health uh, Service District. Chris then went on to work at the uh, Royal Children's Hospital in uh, Hurston to develop the Deadly Ears um, Indigenous Hearing Health Program for Queensland and later adopted as the National Indigenous Hearing Health Program by the Federal Government. Following this, following this policy development and management experience, Chris was invited to apply for the ENT training program but declined the offer to follow his interests in ophthalmology. He returned to full-time medicine to undertake two years of ophthalm ophthalmic uh, residency at the PA eye casualty and murder ophthalmology departments before being accepted to the Queensland Ophthalmology uh, Training Program as the country's first and only Indigenous ophthalmology trainee. Dr Alavaker has completed four years of ophthalmology training in Queensland and is <coughs> currently working, uh, currently waiting the city's exit exams for ophthalmology in early 2017. He's an, uh, he is an, a, uh, an associate lecturer with the University of Queensland, has published in, in the areas of neuro ophthalmology and refractive um, surgery. He was recently nominated for the Chief Minister's Award for Excellence uh, for his services and the uh, inaugural Outreach Ophthalmology Fellow in the top end of, uh, of the Northern Territory. Outside of work, he is an uh, accomplished uh, pianist and artist. So people would like to welcome Chris up to the Thanks very much, Sean. Technical issue. Uh, first thing to say is it's been a great privilege to be involved with Linda DeMarco and the Ideas Van and uh, it does uh, some pretty incredible work. And some of my slides, uh, obviously we have a mixed audience here, so I, I want to go through um, some reasonably basic ophthalmic uh, slides, so I apologise if, uh, if for some people, if for some people, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit basic in some areas, but I want to talk about some of the diagnostic stuff, and uh, more importantly, about what we're looking for on the van, because although the van itself uh, it, you know, is established to pick up diabetes, in the course of looking for diabetes through uh, retinal photography, there are a series of other diagnoses that are quite important uh, that we'll come, come across. How do I get this? <coughs>
So that's the, that's, we call it the van, it's actually a, a very good truck. Um, and it's, it's down in the, uh, in the car park, as Linda mentioned earlier, so uh, for people if they want to have a look throughout the day, they can, they can head down and have a look. Um, so diabetes is a snapshot, again, some, some you know, fairly fundamental stuff. These stats are from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, but you know, about one in 10 of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population have diabetes, it tends to affect us at a younger age, and uh, the rates are higher in rural and remote areas. The fund is photography undertaken uh, in the AMSs, which then directs the patients who will be seen in a particular community when the van comes along. Um, there's the retinal screening itself, and they, uh, we're looking for thermic diagnoses, but there are also uh, signs that can be seen in the eye that can indica indicate more sinister systemic illness. And so what we're doing can and does, in fact, save lives. The screening itself is important for vision. Uh, we have optometrists on board who assist with the refractive disorders of the eye. Uh, as it said in the video, we can deliver very high standards of care to quite rural and remote areas. But an important premise of the ideas van is that any screening program that's undertaken has to be coupled with treatment and service delivery. And so we undertake the fundus photography and that goes through Paul Mitchell in Sydney. But then the, the, the van itself is the service delivery arm of what we do. The cameras, they're called a DRS camera, they're quite uh, quite mobile, you can put them in a box and move them around wherever you need to take them. And this map demonstrates sites where photography is undertaken across Queensland. So there's, there are a range of, of sites that are feeding the retinal photographs through to Westmead to Professor Mitchell. Um, Ophthalmology 101, I can't get away from being a doctor. Uh, for some of us, we may need a little bit of a refresher, but that's cross-section of the eye. And, uh, and of course, the camera takes a, a photograph through the clear media. And if there's any opacity in the media along the way, then that's going to affect the quality of the photograph. This is an example of you know, a perfect um, fundus uh, photograph. They're often not this clear. And you can see that, that we can visualise to the mid periphery. Uh, and most of the important diagnostic signs will be seen within that frame. So, we have both primary ophthalmic diagnoses, as I mentioned, that can be picked up, and that includes some of the, your, your, most of the maculopathies, some of them are, are subclinical, as well as glaucoma, retinal detachment, and then there are systemic disorders, diabetes being the big one, uh, but hypertension, that could be a carotid artery disease, it could be metastatic disease, it could be neoplastic disease, and inflammatory disorders. So it's a large list of things that we can pick up simply through fundus photography. We'll start with diabetes, and, and diabetes has significant effects on the vision and on individuals due to a number of changes. So there can be refractive changes, uh, there can be cataracts, which is also to an extent tied into refractive changes, and then you can have your, uh, you, you know, your vascular changes at the back of the eye that, that affect the functioning of the retina, whether it be the macula or in the periphery, so your diabetic retinopathy, your diabetic maculopathy and then there are systemic manifestations of diabetes as well. These are some examples of what we're looking at. So the photographs go to Paul Mitchell in Westmead and, and he's looking at the, the, you know, the clinical features on the photographs and, and from, the, uh, from the top picture we have a mild, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and then it grades through to moderate and severe. And you can see increasing amounts of blood, cotton wool spots and heart exudates. Here are some uh, photos from uh, Professor Mitchell himself, in fact, uh, that he has read. And again, you can see one of the eyes uh, has quite a lot of heart exudate around the macula. That will have a very uh, significant effect on vision. And then further down, there's a treated eye. And you can see some laser spots in there. And we'll come across uh, to treatment modalities soon, what we actually do, do, do with these eyes. So these images go to Prof Mitchell. He grades them and that information is fed back the appropriate patients are then seen on, on the truck, on the van. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy in many respects is, is you know, that's, that's the end stage. That's where we don't want to go. Uh, we can have bleeding into the vitreous, which is the clear meter at the back of the eye. We can have neovascularization uh, that not only bleeds, but then also sclerosis and can cause quite significant traction or retinal detachments. By the time we're getting to the lower pictures, it's starting to become unsalvageable. 
Um, we want to prevent that, and, and, and that's what this this program is all about. But this is you know this this is end game. It's not often pictures like this will come through, but they're fairly horrifying when they do. There is a series of sophisticated equipment on the van um, that fortunately does travel safely. And uh, probably the most important is what we call an OCT machine. And OCT machines have been revolutionary in ophthalmology. It gives us a virtual cross-section of the macula. And, and we have an example of, of a normal healthy macula on, on the lower part of the slide. And above that is a picture of the OCT machine itself. So it's very user-friendly. The patient sits at the machine and gives us a cross-section. Uh, that helps us guide treatment. So this is important for your maculopathies. And I have an example here of a picture. You can see the normal, the normal OCT, uh, which is labelled with severe vitreous nerve fibre layer, similar to the picture we saw in the last slide. And next to that is the cross-section of the macula that's been affected by diabetic maculopathy. You can see those dark spaces of the macula, they're cystic spaces, that's fluid. And the presence of that fluid significantly degrades the vision. Until not that long ago, say six years ago, uh, this was reasonably difficult to treat. We would either inject steroids into the eye and have significant side effects with the steroids, or if it was parafaveal, so not right at the favea, there was laser treatment available. But again, that had issues. Laser treatment isn't reversible and it can cause scotomas or small blind spots. Uh, luckily, uh, there are lots of new technologies entering ophthalmology and, and so anti-VEGF therapy was introduced a number of years ago. Uh, the graph demonstrates, it's a graph from, from you know, one, of the, one of the proprietary labels, uh, publications, but it demonstrates that there are significant improvements in vision and what the anti-VEGF does is, is it, it stops the leakage of the vessels so we end up with, with normal faveal anatomy again. It's, the delivery of the drug is uh, by direct injection into the eye, which sounds horrific. It's well tolerated after the first injection, that's, that's always the most confrontational. It's via a 30 gauge needle. The main issue here is that for a lot of diabetic maculopathy, these people require ongoing injections monthly to two monthly. And, uh, and the injections themselves fortuitously are able to be delivered on the van. So that's one of the treatments that's delivered on the van. And uh, laser treatment for the more peripheral disease, uh, we have, it's done in a slit lamp. We have examples of, of fresh laser, those white spots. Um, and this effectively stops the leakage of the vessels. The lower picture demonstrates the after effects. So Blitzkrieg is what we want. Yes, they develop night blindness. Yes, they lose peripheral vision, uh, but we, we trade that off for the maintenance of central vision. And we can deliver this on the ideas van, and again, end game is surgical treatment. This is just a snapshot of, uh, I guess, <coughs> important signs that uh, if anybody was out there looking at some of these pictures, they would be looking for at the back of the eye. And these, as my GP colleagues would be well aware, are the the, you know, the wider systemic manifestations of diabetes. And that's certainly not forgotten by the ideas van by involving the endocrinologists and, uh, and associated specialties. I'll go through some of the, the, uh, the diagnosis that can impact on uh, patients uh, systemically, but the last two big ones from a thermic perspective are macular degeneration. Again, we can pick that up on the van and cataracts. And I don't know if that deadly surgeon is, but that's a good photo. Um, <laughs> So life-saving diagnoses, I'll, I'll just touch on a few and then I'll invite Linda up to talk about the van itself, but obviously hypertension can be seen uh, with changes at the back of the eye. We can see evidence of coronary artery thrombosis and often these are small emboli that are seen in the arterial system. Um, they're correlated later with further investigation. Compressive tumours, we can see compressive tumours uh, and what we're looking at is, is the nerve itself, it'll either become pale or it'll, it'll enlarge. We can have funny looking changes in the periphery, so there could be pigmented changes, and, and chirpy is the one that I've shown here and that's associated with familial adenomatous polyposis. Uh, we can have changes at the back, again, vascular looking changes that are associated with renal cell carcinomas. We can pick up evidence of systemic metastatic disease, uh, again, through pigmentary changes across the retina. Uh, and 
and then wider metastatic disease. We can sometimes see METs themselves in the choroid, as well as, again, um, wider systemic vascular choroid artery disease. So this is just an example of, of some of the systemic illnesses that we can pick up through uh, fungal photography and, uh, and some of the, the diabetic changes that, that Professor Mitchell is looking at down in Westmead. So I'll hand over to, uh, to Lyndall now. An overview: We have 37, uh, 30, oh, 39. I forgot. 39 visiting uh, volunteer clinicians, orthoptists, um, ophthalmologists, and uh, and um, optometrists. They take a day off um, in the month, and uh, they they give us that day. They're absolutely amazing people. Um, we can all services are bulk built. No one pays anything on the van, and uh, we can see 31 patients in a day. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, with the normal outreach, it's not possible to do 31 patients in a day. But because we have everything there, uh, we can just push them through. Um, we have a shared electronic medical record so that the patient files can go safely onto the van, uh, that the doctors can fill, fill it up, uh, go back to their surgery, do their letters, but it goes straight back to the, the record. That was an important inclusion. And uh, so we just go very quickly on to the next. Uh, this is the, the pathway. We've trained about 137 people in how to use a retinal camera. And um, they are the ones that uh, make it happen, sending them to Professor Mitchell. But this is a GP-driven initiative. It's the GPs that need to, to, to drive this initiative, not the van. The, the health home of these diabetes patients is the GP. So they're the ones who need to do that. Um, this is our target group, um, but we are finding people much younger are being affected by diabetic retinopathy now. Oh, it doesn't go. It doesn't go anymore. Oh, no, that goes back. It doesn't go anymore. There it is. That's an idea of all of the sites that we <laughs> photograph. Would anyone like to... Uh, 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 maybe uh, suggest who the largest amount of photographs come from. Anyone? It's from Charleville. Little tiny Charleville, out in Western Queensland, with tiny little population, no ophthalmologists, no optometrists, and they put those cameras in their buses and they go out and they go to all the communities. Marvellous people. And oh. Finally, you know there's a, a new Medicare number that's coming now. It's coming in November the 1st for screening, $50 rebate. Um, this will be hopefully an encouragement for a screen to be part of diabetes management. There's 100 retinal cameras being distributed by the Commonwealth Government. Uh, so the ideas then means that you can stay home. You don't have to get in the car to get your eyes checked, get in the car to have an appointment, get in the car to come back and, mark and come back, especially if you live in Charleville, which is nine hours from, and you have to go to Brisbane. So the, the ideas van fills that gap. This is where we go. We don't go there every month, but we go as the need arises. And finally, that's the results. See, I'm not doing well here. I'm a better driver of a car than this. So there we are. We're pretty proud that in two years, since, since March 2014, 3,849 patients have been screened who would never, ever have had that opportunity. 19,000 19, photographs have been graded for free by Professor Mitchell. We've had 110 clinics, and the patients who've actually got Diabetic retinopathy and treated on the van have been 2,000. And the little old van has gone 160,000 kilometres. So I hope you can come over and uh, see it if you have the time. And uh, because we're having a, a load of fun and helping hopefully a lot of people. Thank you.
uh, Lyndall and Chris for that presentation. I will save questions until the end of the, uh, uh, of the pre uh, presenters. So our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Professor Martin Nakata. He's a Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Centre at James Cook University, supporting Indigenous students to succeed in the higher education sector. He's a Torres Strait Islander who has worked in the field of Indigenous education for almost 40 years. He's widely published uh, in this field and has undertaken extensive work to improve the educational outcomes of Indigenous students in higher education and settings. So we'd like to welcome Professor Martin. Thank you very much, Professor Martin. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm from the Torres Strait, um, the place where the van actually don't go. <laughs> we'll work on that though, won't we? Uh, it's strange we're back here, it's like the naughty corner. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd like to also add my acknowledgement to the traditional um, owners of the country here uh, and thank the organisers for inviting me here uh, today. Um, today, I just want to uh, uh, share some work that we've been doing over the last few years and um, hopefully uh, um, uh, communicate some of the kinds of uh, priorities we need uh, for getting our students not just into degree courses but uh, out uh, the other end as well. Um, the kinds of stuff we've been uh, doing over the last few years uh, are quite extensive, uh, but if you can take away uh, these three messages, uh, these are the kinds of things that we've been um, uh, seeing as very crucial in the way that we progress students through their degree programs and out the other side. Um, so um, uh, um, for those of us who are involved in uh, student support issues across the country and those who teach uh, our students in the faculties, uh, attention to capacity is really a crucial uh, aspect of, of uh, getting kids uh, um, in and through degrees. Um, our at attention to the details of the kind of learning support needs that these kids actually have. And uh, the key one has really been uh, the student finances area. Um, I've, I've just recently uh, relocated from UNSW where we, uh, most of the work that I'll be talking about today comes from. Um, the student finances one has been very interesting. Um, in the medical um, studies area, uh, James Cook, Newcastle and UOWA has been uh, recognised as, as the, the kind of leaders in this area. But UNSW has kicked on at uh, more recent times. And today, or uh, uh, well, particularly uh, last, last year's cohort, is the, uh, the highest number of medical enrolments now at UNSW in the country. Uh, and I, I attribute that to a lot of the, the, the funding that was achieved to, to provide students with uh, medical scholarships. And um, 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 I think that the huge gains they made in, in the short amount of years has been really primarily uh, because of that. Uh, but all, of course we won't forget the really good teaching that goes in, in all of the medical faculties. Um, it's a snapshot of uh, the country at the moment for all degrees. Uh, we've been uh, um, creeping along at about 1,000 a year uh, in the last few years, uh, but predominantly most of our uh, kids are in the social sciences and humanities area, and, um, um, and there, there are good reasons why, 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 they're, 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 why that is, and hopefully it will become a little bit more clear as we go through. The preoccupation with our higher education courses has really been at the front end of a the activities, um, putting bums on seats, the federal government's funding in this area has essentially been uh, used for uh, 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 emphasising that point of getting social inclusion agendas mobilised. But what this has inevitably done um, in the sector has been uh, pushing the activities more towards kind of getting the kids in the, the outreach activity, the, the pre-entry activity, uh, the, the recruitment of the courses. But um, very little of that, even the, the programmatic funding, uh, is, is kind of a bit silent on the way that we progress and complete students. 
And here's a typical graph of that, where you have a lot of activities uh, in the in the recruitment and the access area. But as we get along to the progression and completion area, we see an absence of funding, an absence of activities, largely. And the work that has been done over the last 20 years is the it's really uh, lacking some empirical um, um, studies in this area about uh, w what an unprepared student look like, uh, how do we uh, provide support for that, um, how that support actually ties to the actual capacity, whether it's effective or not, and so on and so forth. Uh, we patched the system with a whole lot of different measures, uh, uh, variously uh, in different universities. But largely, um, it's been uh, driven on, on, on on um, a lot of opinions. Um, the last review of the higher ed sector in this area, uh, similarly evidences some of these issues where <clears throat> they are too very uh, frustrated about the kind of lack of progress in getting our kids through. Um, so they're here again, call for a whole of university approach, um, bearing more responsibility on faculties to take up their the primary responsibility for supporting kids. I actually disagree with this position uh, because uh, the centres established in universities, their raising debtor was because the faculties couldn't do it. And here we have a higher ed review pushing it back that way again. But what's really been evident through the, 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 the final recommendation by the review to the sector has been a lack of uh, the framework for success. So they weren't able to advise universities really about what actually uh, they could do to actually uh, drive success in um, in the in the sector. Uh, James Cook University is where I am at the moment, and um, but here too, coming off the review, you can see desperate kind of ways to try and make things uh, go forward, but again with an absence of refinement for success. And there's really very really good reasons for this, um, and and I'm hoping that will come a little bit clearer today. So as you uh, get to work in this area over time, you, you get to see what's not going on. And one, of, one of the things primarily that's not going on is that universities are not really understanding the cohort uh, that's coming to them. They're not understanding what unpreparedness means. They're not understanding what to do about that. Yeah? So if you look across the sector, and these, these are slides that are a bit dated now, um, but they give the general suggest um, parents are keeping kids at school, kids are staying along that school, we are getting more into the higher ed sector and we're increasing in about 52% over the last 10 or so years. Um, these have provided us good numbers in the, in the secondary school system, you know, just under 70,000, probably now in, in 16, that's probably around about 70,000, 80,000. But as you drill further into the details of some of these characteristics, you see kind of trends uh, here uh, in, in one little uh, aspect with the NAPLAN results. You see they start off at year three very, very good, and then they get to year five, and then they get to year seven, and get, get to year nine. So these are, this slide was pulled around about the 30, 12, 30 here, and these are aspirational targets by the government. But yes, we, we are increasing. But the overall pattern of behaviour is that it drops from year to year as they go up and up through the school years. So from this you see similar kinds of things with writing, and you see similar kinds of things with numeracy, and as you get to look at the retention values across the school sector, you see a kind of a diminishing um, scale where we get quite a few uh, through the system, uh, but a lot do drop out. So if you cut away the, the data just to look at the kids from years 10 to 12, you see that we actually lose quite a lot of kids in those final years. And, and this, this, that's no wonder for us because if the map line is showing that the kids are slowly getting further and further, further behind, well, what's the point in staying around? Yeah? And so you see a lot of kids bowing uh, as they get towards the year 12. But here's a slide that we, 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 we did some studies in there, we tried to pull out some reliable data. Um, to try and emphasize what the effect of this was. And here's a, just a grab from the 2005-8 slides. This line here in particular is really an interesting one because uh, that actually uh, denotes the kinds of numbers of kids who get into uh, courses with the requisite scores. So here you can see in 08, 
Um, there are 300 kids who actually have the requisite score to get into the, the courses, the elected courses, nationally. And that came from a cohort of just under 5,000 students. So what we're getting in the university is really a really big issue and a big problem that we really have to address and not flirt with in the ways that we've been flirting with it. Uh, in New South Wales, that's where I was, where we tried to understand these figures. Of those 300, we only actually received 63 in the entire state of New South Wales. And from, but from the cohort of the previous year, of 57, we actually enrolled in that, that uh, following year the 1,229 students. So this is, this is the reality of, of what centres like ours actually have to deal with, and universities don't actually understand that, nor do faculties understand this. So how do you catch up 12 years of neglect and get kids through in the same amount of years as their cohort? Who would like that job? Not many. So here's the problem. Most um, um, universities um, look at the gap in, in the, in the uh, education capacity in these ways. They see the numbers in the school sector and they say, well, we're a university, we have to keep our high standards and you know, we'll compromise with putting in some special entry processes. But in the gap, you really have to deal with that. And so largely what we've done in the gap is uh, develop self-esteem courses, role modeling courses, leadership courses, none of which actually directly addresses the 12 years of neglect. And that's where we've been for the last 20 years. And, and, and no wonder we're getting the results we see today. The completion rate currently in Australia is below 50%, as you saw the minister uh, uh, announced last week. Uh, it's about 47% completion rate in the country, across all of those, uh, across the sector. And for me, um, the, the, the part of the reason is that we're not able to understand what this, this gap is. And so, just to recap, uh, we get about 5%, uh, up just about 5% from the school, with the requisite score. Uh, the remainder, um, uh, we uh, get through special entry programs, and we, we now, in some courses, uh, except uh, level th so threes and fours, we're entering to some of the courses, workplaces, um, uh, the uh, various qualities of people who are reapplying as mature age students, and similarly with the, the community. And so for universities who are given contacts or targets to chase to, to get indigenous numbers into the universities, uh, these are very hard yards to, to make. Um, because if you've only got uh, 5% has to be in the, in, the, in the marketplace, uh, there's a lot of vying for that 5% and, and uh, most of the G8 wins because they've got a high number of uh, full, full scholarships, right? But for regional universities, they just don't have a chance. So, for me, this really has been the kind of preoccupation of 20 years that will let us down a rabbit hole with Dorothy. Um, what, what, when you do study the numbers and when you do start to face the realities um, that um, I'm just showing you what that actually means and how that manifests in, in, the, in the work that we do with kids arriving without the requisite capacity. Um, we do understand that they come in at a very low base. Uh, we backpack them with a lot of tutoring, a lot of supplementary courses, a lot of enabling courses, foundational courses, and onwards we go through the years. Uh, more and more tutoring, more and more group tutoring, more and more um, um, extra shoots, um, and we spend money um, 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 at a great, great rate. Um, but they do make gains, but they have to do that every year. So we backpack them every year with more and more support. And as they come out at the end of their degrees, um, they end up like uh, the hunchback of Notre Dame, you know, <laughs> uh, with <laughs> way later, with so much weight on their back. They've never actually enjoyed the campus experience. They've not been able to build their networks where others have been privileged enough to do it. When they go out as graduates, most of their networks are established. They've got a lot more confidence in their students. And obviously, they're much more competitive in the job market. 
So we understand that. They come in at a higher level. They do make incremental gains from year to year. Yes, they do get some support as well, but they do it at a level where they can take uh, in the, the social activities on campus, uh, enjoy the campus experience, they can travel with their peers across to other countries, um, they can partake in all the excursions because they have money, um, and it's all great. But why is it that our students can't do that? So for us as educationists, we've been studying this for some time and we've argued that that gap up there is the wrong gap. I've given you enough information now for you to tell me now where the, the real gap is. Anyone? I'll tell you. That's the gap. And that's the gap we have to deal with in order to be able to get them up to a level where they can start enjoying their courses just as much as they, the other kids are enjoying their, their classes. But how do we do that? How do we actually catch up to 12 years from the day? So what we've done over the last five years, and this is a case study we've been managing course uh, since 2010, and we've built, um, we've done a lot of research work, and we've decided that that in centres like ours, we had to create a, a section that was dedicated to learning support to try and catch up this gap. They not only had to be uh, there to address the learning issues, but we stacked the deck with like, school teachers, particularly uh, I was interested in uh, primary school teachers because they are the ones that are much more skilled in, in, develop, in incrementally uh, the developing capacities, not subject expert as they are in the secondary school. So we ended up with a whole lot of um, very, very good people in that area. And we, we, one of them was actually a PhD in maths. And uh, uh, we were able to elevate uh, some of the activities that of engagement with the with the uh, uh, students, and and uh, we set them a particular structure um, to, to work through, uh, and not just just be available to students, but in the process you know, they had to be, be explicitly dealing with the proficiency levels of the students, and as as the years went on, they had to deal with the knowledge and skills development as they get into disciplinary content, and then they had to have uh, be dealing with uh, later year students. Uh, um, around the development of conceptual understanding because that's when we start to hit, hit the theory levels. And uh, so a very dedicated team, a very structured way of engaging the learning support and not just be doing process management, waiting for kids to fall over and we run after them, which is what all your, all your university higher ed, indigenous higher ed centers do currently. Uh, we were not content with uh, uh, running a crisis management centre, so we've actually gone the other way to try and develop an educational tool here. Um, we um, had to deal uh, with an issue that we discovered about unprepared kids, and that was really to do with their capacity. You know, uh, um, can we influence that capacity? Uh, do we understand what that capacity Do our traditional assessment regimes actually tell us anything about that capacity? Or are we really content Though we complain about it, uh, the ATAR schools, and just take them and say, well, you got it or you don't got it, yeah. So, but what we did was we, we revisited all our procedures in our assessment regimes. We undertook a, a thorough review of them, and, and like it, you wouldn't understand. We were very limited in the capacity to understand the capacity of our students, and, um, and and to travel just along with the OP schools and ATAR schools was just inadequate. So we did that. We found other ways to be able to measure this capacity, and 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 we introduced uh, interviews schemes, uh, pre-programs, um, uh, 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 different diagnostic tools, um, different. Um, uh, we imported uh, tests from uh, international students and we adapted them so that we can get a really much broader understanding of what the students' capabilities are. And we not only did that, but we actually used the, that, the profile of the stuff that we were gathering as the beginning point for how we would then devise our learning support strategy. So it was now a much more informed position than that we were previously. Previously, again, we wait till they fall over, and we all ran with the, uh, what's your language, first aid kit, and we're trying to fix up the problem as we go. People said, um, you know, you've got to 
tinker with the social justice measure we've got here in the selection process and you know, our kids have been done over through history and we need special entry process. Yeah, that's fine, but we're not going to set them up to fail. They said, but the standards are too high. I said, well, we're not going to set them up to fail. We're done with that now. We don't want to keep adding to experiences of failure from the community. And even my staff were able against it. But over the years, uh, this is what happened. Uh, enrollment numbers went up, first preferences went up, in all the measure, typical measures of university would, uh, would, would measure in terms of the progress of recruitment areas, uh, we went up on all scales. From year to year, this could be seen that our enrollment and my numbers went up. So um, the idea that um, raising uh, entry standard is going to diminish your enrollment numbers uh, is not necessarily true. Importantly, from the learning support team and the measures that we've, we've been able to introduce, this is what happened to our pipeline. So this is a raw commencing and continuing number of school. So as you can see from the red bar, the number of kids now from year to year is actually growing, which means more and more kids are staying in more and more years throughout their degree program. And as we know, that is a formula for success in completion. We not only did that, oh by the way, uh, last year at UNSW we were able to change, achieve a retention rate of 80.3, which is higher than the sector average for all students. So this work can be done if we stop flirting with soft approaches and start getting very seriously the, the kind of learning needs uh, students need and the capacity they need for actually completing courses. Um, we not only did that, but the configuration of the code actually changed in that time as well. So as you can see from this, it's quite different from the, the national one I showed you before where the preoccupation is with the arts and humanities and the social science. 21% of the students are actually in, in medicine. And uh, last year, um, well, two years ago, um, there were six medical graduates in that year, and last year there were eight. So these are numbers probably uh, are not normal in the sector, and and um, but if you get it right and you get the right support for students, you can be rewarded with high number of graduates. And that's it for me. Thank you, Professor. There was um, some interesting points and hot topics that have been discussed for many years with our, our, our members and our students who, who um, come from different backgrounds and in, in entries into the university and uh, who struggle at different levels for those reasons that you did mention. So, um, and I can relate to some of those as well, but I won't go to discuss my background and my story uh, because we need to introduce the next speaker. Okay, so uh, next uh, speaker is Dr. Anthony Bartow. Uh, he was elected Vice President of the Australian Medical Association in May 2016. He served as President of the AMA Victoria uh, from 2014 to 2016 and is Vice President of the AMA Victoria from 2012 to 2014. Mr. Bartain is, a, is an experienced GP and management executive working in two GP uh, settings in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. His principal specialty interests uh, include men's health, mental health counselling, care co coordination of patients with multiple chronic illnesses and aged care. Dr Bartain graduated from Melbourne University in 1984 after completing his res residency at um, St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne and obtained his fellowship with the Rural Australian College of General Practitioners in 1990. Dr. Bartano also completed a Master's of Business Administration from the Melbourne Business School in 2004 with first class honours average. 
Dr. Bartan uh, has held many federal AMA council and committee positions since 2008, including serving as a member of the AMA Council of General Practice. Uh, at the 2016 AMA National Conference, Dr. Bartone was awarded uh, Fellowship of the Association with rec recognition of his outstanding services in the AMA as a mark of the high esteem in which he is held by his uh, fellow members. So that's walking. Welcome, Dr. Bartow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that very warm welcome. And good morning, everyone. Can I also uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, and also pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I'd like to thank the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association for inviting me to speak at your annual networking event. It's indeed a privilege to be here representing uh, the Australian Medical Association. Can I also acknowledge some of the great work by the previous presenters this morning? It's been really uh, inspiring and eye-opening from someone down south, so well done. As a GP practising medicine for 30 years, I understand the strengths and resilience that is needed to survive uh, the intense medical education and training. I understand the strength and resilience that is needed to overcome the constant exposure to illness and death that working in medicine brings. However, as an Australian, albeit of Italian origin, and not having the lived experience of an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, I can't fully understand the strength and resilience that is required of Indigenous doctors. I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people face adversity in many aspects of their lives. And I would argue that this is reflected by the appalling state of Indigenous health. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are needlessly sicker and are dying much younger than their non-Indigenous peers. What is even more disturbing for me is that many health problems and deaths stem from preventable causes. While there has been some success in reducing childhood mortality and smoking rates, the high levels of chronic disease among Indigenous people continue to be of considerable concern. For the Australian Medical Association, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health is a key priority. It's our responsibility, and I believe a responsibility of the entire medical profession to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have the best possible health. The AMA has a long history of advocating for better health outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This has taken many forms. The AMA has a task force on Indigenous health, chaired by the President, who couldn't be here today, which recommends Indigenous health policy and strategies for our organisation. The task force includes representation from the AMA membership, from AIDA, NACHO, the Royal Australian College of GPs, and the Australian Medical Students Association, who have all offered their expertise to the AMA since its inception back in 2000. It is through the task force that the AMA develops its annual report card on Indigenous health. These report cards comment on topical issues in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and recommend solutions that we urge governments to embrace. The consistent message in all of these report cards is that the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will not improve until the factors that contribute to the poor health are addressed. Last year, our report card on Indigenous health focused on the impacts of incarceration on the health of Indigenous people in custodial settings. The report card showed that the life expectancy and the overall health are definitively linked to incarceration. 
certain mental health conditions, substance abuse, and cognitive disabilities are significant drivers of the imprisonment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. <coughs> These issues have contributed to, the, to comprising a significant portion of those in custody. The 2015 report card called on governments to target health issues as part of an integrated effort to reduce imprisonment rates. However, in nearly 12 months since the AMA has made these calls, not much has changed. The AMA will continue to call on governments to take meaningful action to reduce number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people represented in the justice system. This must change. For 2016, the AMA report card on Indigenous health will focus on rheumatic heart disease, an entirely preventable condition that affects, as you all know, the valves of the heart. Rheumatic heart disease is a disease of poverty. It primarily is localised to third world and developing countries. For Australians, rheumatic heart disease is, is consigned to history, along with overcrowded inner city slums and pre-penicillin era, in which the disease once thrived in this country. Yet, rheumatic heart disease is prevalent in Indigenous communities. In fact, Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory are reported to have the highest incidence of the disease in the world. This, I'm sure you all agree, is totally unacceptable. Rheumatic heart disease should not be occurring in Australia in the 21st century. When we launch our 2016 report card on Indigenous health later this year, the AMA hopes that the governments will hear our calls to rid Australia of this debilitating condition. Our governments must address the broader social determinants of health that contribute to the development of this disease. When it comes to Indigenous health, the federal government must broaden its thinking. For too long now, people working in Indigenous health have called for actions to address these social issues that affect the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. You know what they are education, housing, employment, transport. These all affect health too. This has been clearly outlined in the government's own National Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, Health Plan 2013 to 2023. Yet we continue to see inaction on this front. The AMA recognises that Indigenous doctors are critical to improving health outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander doctors have a unique ability to align their clinical and cultural expertise to improve access services to services and provide culturally appropriate care for Indigenous patients. But there are too few Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander doctors and medical students in Australia. You know the stats. In 2014, the Department of Health estimated that around 260 of the 85,000 or so doctors in the country were Indigenous. The, indigenal, the Indigenous medical workforce must grow significantly to achieve overall improvements in Indigenous health. To help boost numbers of Indigenous medical students and ultimately doctors, the AMA has offered a scholarship to, to an Indigenous medical student each year since 1994. Our scholarship supports Indigenous medical students for a full duration of their degree to help relieve the financial burden of studying medicine. One of our former scholarship recipients said that his graduation means the Indigenous medical workforce is slowly but surely growing and that is a great step forward for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. He said that for Indigenous patients and their families, having a doctor who understands an Aboriginal perspective, someone who understands culture and some of the circumstances of Aboriginal people is really important. It's not rocket science. He said that the connection really helps people in their treatment 
and ultimately improves their health outcomes. Increasing the number of Indigenous doctors is a goal not just for the AMA, but for all those involved in closing the gap and improving the health and the well-being of Australia's First People. In 2004, when the AMA launched its report card on Indigenous health, titled <coughs> Healing Hands, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Workforce Requirements, we called on governments to identify and fully fund places to achieve parity in the number of doctors and other health professionals. That was in 2004. More than a decade later, the AMA is still pursuing this objective. I, along with everyone else in the AMA, want to see action, not words. I want to see more doctors, not committees. I want to see training programs, not more bureaucracy. The AMA will continue to advocate for an increase in the number of Indigenous doctors in Australia. The AMA is also an active participant in the Close the Gap campaign and lobbies of matters of key importance to Indigenous health, such as increasing health funding and scrapping unfair patient co-payment policies. The AMA has been a persistent and sustained and powerful voice on Indigenous health for decades. During that time, much has changed for the better, particularly as a result of the Close the Gap campaign, although recent cutbacks to the funding are a significant concern. Despite good intention and a considerable investment by successive governments, the disparity in health outcomes remains. Each year, the Prime Minister delivers a report on closing the gap, which in re recent years has unfortunately been <coughs> profoundly disappointing. The Prime Minister's Closing the Gap report sadly do not deliver the many positive outcomes to improve Indigenous health. Nor do they deliver one extra doctor where and when they are needed most. They need they provide no new funding. We all acknowledge that closing the gap is an incredibly difficult task, and yet it is fair to say that Australians have learnt much about how to close the gap over a number of decades. There have been gains, and we need to ensure that Australians and our governments don't fatigue in that task. It will take time, but most of all, it will take ongoing commitment. The AMA has repeatedly said that it is not credible that Australia, one of the world's wealthiest countries, cannot address the, work, the health and social justice issues that affect a 3% minority of its citizens. The AMA will continue to say this and advocate on this. I urge all governments to make meaningful investments in Indigenous health. I urge governments to, make immediate, to take immediate action to improve the health and well-being of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Without this, the gap will remain wide and intractable. The AMA is working closely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to develop solutions to respond <coughs> appropriately to their health needs. The fact that they are our first people only adds to the moral imperative to act. And I'm sure you agree that some of the uh, presentations this morning only further uh, go to in bridging that gap. And again, I acknowledge the work that they've done. And I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tan, for those. Uh strong words and being an uh, uh, advocate and, uh, and supporter for Aboriginal people and, and for, for AIDA. Um, I, I, I think we agree we, we need more action, more recommendations and, um, and we, you know, we great to work closely with AMA in the future as well. So let's thank Dr. Bonnie again one more time please.
So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Philip uh, Truscott. He's the president of the Royal Australian Australasian College of Surgeons. Uh, his uh, presentation will be on the Royal Austral Australasian College of Surgeons Rec Reconciliation Action Plan. Uh, Philip is a general surgeon with a uh, interest in upper, upper GI surgery, HB, uh, HPB at the uh, Prince of Wales Hospital in Sydney. Over the past 15 years, he has taken an active role in both the College of Surgeons and the General Surgeons of Australia. He is a past president of the General Surgeons of Australia and uh, was elected college president in 2016. His major interest is in the provision of emergency surgery in our current clinical environment of uh, subspecialisation. There are major advantages that uh, flow from increasing subspecialisation, uh, but equally there are considerable problems that can be uh, that can develop as uh, it relates to acute care provision, particularly in regional and remote Australia and New Zealand. Um, as a result, he has been involved in the design and assessment of models of care and uh, to try and address these uh, competing issues. His other major challenge is the uh, sustainability of surgical services and the preservation of professionalism. So let's welcome Philip to the stage, please. Thank you very much, Sean, and I'd uh, also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and, and like to thank you for asking me to come today to talk with you. Um, the College of Surgeons has a, a very strong commitment uh, to improving the number of Indigenous surgeons, and I'd like to outline what we're trying to do briefly in that regard. Uh, we certainly accept the concept that, that uh, or, the, or the fact that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands are, are our first inhabitants and need to be duly respected for this. Uh, we've done a, a fair bit in relation to uh, recognition, and you can see there that uh, uh, Professor Kelvin Kong, who was our first ENT, um, first Indigenous surgeon, uh, was <coughs> awarded the, the RACS Medal, one of our highest honours for his contribution to Indigenous health. And uh, Francis Flanagan, uh, who's also an ENT surgeon, been given the first Indigenous medal for his contribution. So we are trying very hard to recognise people who are doing things in this space. We, we've had a um, Indigenous Health Committee uh, for almost 10 years now, so it's not something we've just started. And Kelvin Kong was our first chair, and now David Murray, who's currently a HPB trainee, or not trainee, he's a fellow, uh, is doing further training, uh, is, is the current chair. So it's something we're taking very seriously from a governance perspective. We've been trying to support uh, Indigenous health in as many ways as we can. We're very proud to be a gold sponsor at this meeting and clearly will continue to do so. And uh, we've also tried to recognise and provide incentives and scholarships to Indigenous trainees and medical students in order to engage in surgical life. In May 2015, we, we actually signed a commitment uh, to develop recon the reconciliation plan within a 12-month period that we've developed. And that's the executive of our <coughs> council uh, who signed it on that day. What has then happened from our 2014 to 16 reconciliation plan that we've now a plan that's uh, to be instituted within a 12-month period with very, very um, um, pointed methodologies and aspects of care that we, we need to initiate. It can be looked at in three major areas. That relates to relationships, respect and opportunities. And of course, at the end of this time, we must have a process of assessment. I'd like to go through these and show them to you. There are actually, as I said, three pillars and 17 actions uh, that have been defined. All of these actions have a staff member who's responsible and a very strict timeline in which we would wish to institute them. So it's, uh, it's, it's been taken extremely seriously. I'll go through them. Ensure a strong commitment for the, the reconciliation plan of the college. Establish and maintain an effective um, implementation steering group. Maintain and establish working partnerships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands organisations. And we rely very much on AIDA in this regard. Maintain and establish a relationship with organisations who are aligned with our business. 
appointing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elder in residence. This is causing us a little bit of an issue at the moment, not from the point of view of the concept, but exactly how we go about it and, and, and how we inculcate such an elder within our process. And we're being advised by our Indigenous group as to how this can be done. But it's something that's a very, very high priority as we were informed that it's very important for this sort of connection for people who are of Indigenous origin who are training in surgery. That's the point of it. Also, the point is to increase our awareness of the Indigenous culture and the way we do business. We certainly do participate in National Reconciliation Week and we raise internal awareness of our clan, both in government and in all circles. These are respect issues that we need to address. We, we, we do participate in NIDOC week. We, we raise internal understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands cultural protocols, which is something that we really have to do a lot of work on. We communicate and advocate regularly with fellows, trainees, IMGs and staff and external organisations on relevant Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands issues as it affects them and develop <coughs> implementation to improve cultural competency training for all our trainees and all our staff. That's a very, very strong commitment to education for all. These are the opportunities we want to try and provide. We want to establish a network of fellows working all in with interest in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands. So we have a, a true interest group that's identified and resourced by the college. <coughs> we want to develop and implement Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island training, recruitment and support strategies. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, I, I'd just like to talk to this graphic. Some might find it a little bit confronting, but it, it's clear as Professor Natarka has said, and he's nailed it absolutely correct, and it's all our advice and our understanding. It, it does need to be a bar, there, there has to be a bar. You don't want to set people up to fail. Uh, and, and I've seen this happen where, where not so much the standards, but the the way, well, you know, because of Aboriginal, you will get a job no matter what. That's the inappropriate way of doing it. There has to be sufficient support as shown in this equity cartoon. We've got to know what those boxes are. And it's not just funding. Um, it's a lot to do with culture and other issues. It's interesting, Kelvin Kong, I've known since a third year medical student, um, and he told me that the only reason he finished medicine was because of, of his grandmother. And I said, how was that so? He said, I wanted to play football for Australia. And she said, I wasn't to do that. Now, those of you who may know Kelvin, I think he would have made uh, an Australian football team, but he, it wasn't in the sights of his grandmother and he respected that. So there's all sorts of cultural issues within there that we have to understand and we have to educate about. And AIDA is a group that we will refer to and do, do so in order to help us through our Indigenous health group and <coughs> the level. So, it's all about equity and not about equality. It's about equity, getting people to the level. And as, as has been pointed out, it starts probably in high school and, and even before. That the special, special assistance has to be provided in order for people to get to the bar and special assistance once they're there, but not just low in the standard. So we are wanting to increase the number of trainees by a guaranteed post to average on Torres Strait Island applicants who have achieved the minimum standard. So we're not going to drop the standard, but if the standard is reached, there'll be, a, there'll be an advantage to be of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander <coughs> origin. We think that's the way to do it. How we do that at the moment, uh, we're still working through. Clearly with some of the larger specialties, they do tend to select people uh, within a group. They, they select those who are selectable, and then they, they're interviewed, they'll have a cohort who are appointable, but there won't necessarily be enough jobs uh, for them. If an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islands made that group, then in some specialties we'll be in a position uh, to appoint them on that basis and not have to be number one on the ranking. That's what equity is. Um, in the smaller specialty groups, we're still working through how to attain that. And this is a very active discussion going on at the moment in our Board of Surgical Education and Training. And I don't have the answer for you entirely yet, but the commitment is absolutely there. We've also established scholarships, and, and, and I've been even aware of it. If you'd like to go to um, the, the college stand here, you'll, be, you'll hear more about how those work. We want to identify ways of increasing the number of, of staff members within our college. We actually have a staff 
a member whose whose job is in the pause here today, whose entire job is to look at Aboriginality and Aboriginal issues relating to the way the college works at All Sales Training. We also wish to promote reconciliation in all our business, uh, considering all supply and diversity. It is a great tragedy that the, the Aboriginal numbers of Torres Strait Islands in Australia is in the order of 2.4 per cent of our population. We only have we have 5,400 surgeons, and only two of whom are of Aboriginal origin. Uh, that is a, an absolute inequity that needs to be addressed. I think if we can do that, then in, in the essence of all issues of diversity of our community. We should have a surgical population that reflect our community, and this clearly is not the case in this setting. And if we can do that, I think we'll improve Aboriginal health uh, in, as a consequence. So I'd like to thank you for inviting me, and I'd be more than happy to answer questions. And those who have queries, we do have a stand here where all your questions can be answered. Thank you very much. Speech and, and once again, thank you for being a, uh, the college for being a strong advocate and uh, uh, for Aboriginal people and, and for our trainers and recognising the inequality uh, and the struggle that we have. And, and, and Aida looks up for the working close of you and inviting us to the table as well for, for discussions in what that uh, equality can be for our people. I would like to um, invite our speakers up to the uh, desk, please. Some microphones moving around the uh, floor this morning. We've already got one hand up already. <laughs> and they haven't even taken their seats yet. <laughs> so they're keen. So, so thank you once again to the speakers for um, your presentation and, and for attending today. Um, so, some great work there from um, everyone. Um, I'll start with Chris, uh, and um, uh, for your work on that, I, just, I think I'll start the first question: why, um, why you, you chose this um, um, this area of work, and what difficulties, and, and was there any challenges challenges in having um, set, set up this um, uh, this service, and and why did you only know, choose why there are only um, limited locations in Queensland? Um, they can access these services. I know, rather say that I know you can't get to the Torres Strait, but I know it's the top end. We're missing out on that service as well. I think uh, some of the operational issues I'll let Linda speak to, and I certainly can't claim any credit for setting up the service. But I had uh, I had the privilege of being invited along uh, to attend the ITS van uh, last year, I think it was, and uh, I've been to Sherbrooke twice and, and Palm Island once with the van. Um, and uh, I think, and, and then I think that subsequent to that, I, I was able to uh, work with Ideas Van for a couple of months in collecting some, some data. And the data is currently being compiled by Professor Mitchell in Sydney, and uh, he's, he'll be doing some studies around diabetic retinopathy. Um, but as I said, I, I can't claim any credit at all for, for the establishment of the service or, or the running of the service. That's it's entirely um, the work of the Ideas Van itself and, and Linda DeMarco as, as the driving force behind that. So um, I might hand over to Linda to address some of those issues, the operational issues around why, why the van goes where it goes and uh, perhaps speak to some of, some of those topics. Thank you, Chris, for giving me the hard one. Um, as Professor McCarthy gave a great big dig didn't you? <laughs> About why we can go to the Cape. We go where we're invited. When we started this, we spoke to every ophthalmologist that had anything to do with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, I might tell you that we received a, almost a completely closed door when we started this. Um, the ophthalmology world thought we were devaluing their services and uh, vehemently, vehemently stopped us. So there are some places where we just can't go. And um, 
So the, the first thing is we, we we go where there's a road, <laughs> and we can take our two million dollar van. No excuse. No excuse. <laughs> I told I, I I told Blackie, Doctor Blackman, that we. Why didn't you go to Palm Island? And I said, well, there's water there. And, you know, he said, well, that shouldn't stop you. Well, we did. We pay $8,000 and we go on a barge. And we do get there. So he said, yeah, I told you. But going to the Cape and, uh, and et cetera, there are some, some peculiar problems. Um, we have to go where we're invited. We have to go where we're invited. And if it's somebody's territory, um, we can't go there, and it's as simple as that. Um, even if the community control health sector wants them, uh, we simply can't can't go. Um, and uh, because um, of politics, and and that's that's that simple. And uh, uh, it has been very hard work. The first time I presented this, one ophthalmologist supported it. One. One. Then I got six at the end of the first year. And we, we went on and on. Some of our doctors have been pressured not to do it. Um, so it is, it, it, it is quite a tough thing. And so I, I, I wouldn't normally say these things in... in, in but I, I think it's time that I did. <laughs> because I think, I think the medical community has to has to really rally to have these kind of services. Dr Angus Turner has, is now over in West Australia and, and, and he's seen far more people than is possible from an outreach doctor getting on a plane and, and doing a day's work somewhere. It, so it, it, it's a practical thing. And also, as one of our doctors said, you shouldn't be doing third world medicine in a first world country. So we take first world medicine or first world ophthalmology to some really very tiny little places and we give them what they deserve, what they deserve. And some of the equipment on our van, I would say most of Australian hospitals wouldn't have all the equipment. There's a million dollars worth of equipment in that van. So why shouldn't rural and remote communities have access to that sort of equipment. Why should they have to get on a plane or a bus or a car and travel to Brisbane? There is no public ophthalmology where people can turn up at Cairns or at Mackay or at Rockhampton. So the only place you go, Townsville if you can get in, and Brisbane. So if we don't exist, and we shouldn't be the only one that exists. And I'll finish with this. I, I presented at the um, National Health Minister's Conference. Every state wanted one of these vans. Every state was willing to put some money up. The reason we're not there? Politics. Politics because Aboriginal health is a business, correct? It's a business that people get funded for and they will have their only fiefdoms. You can tell I'm not a doctor. And you tell I haven't got a health bone in my body. But I, I've, I've got a bit passionate in my old years. And I think, I think we should have a, one of these buses and it's fine to give $50 per retinal screen. Where are the blooming cameras? And if you take a person's screen and they've got something wrong with them, where do they go? So I do hope you hear this passionate old lady's plea for mobile ophthalmology vans. In the Torres Strait. <laughs> And just introduce yourself and direct your question to the yeah. speaker. Uh,
Kine. Uh, this one's directed at Professor Nakal. So I'm a Radjuri and Beer Pie man, formerly a medical student at the University of Melbourne, but I, I grew up in rural, remote Queensland. Pretty average Koori family, like not a lot of money, didn't do real well in school. <clears throat> and it's really good, like it's good that UNSW is doing great. If anyone asks me, where should I go to bed? I'm always like Newcastle, UNSW, all these really great undergrad kind of programs they're doing like you've got great numbers you're doing great things with your career students but what about bridging that gap like it's like yes we're behind 12 years but how do you bridge that gap because it's great to select the ones who are doing and i may have misread this but it's great to select the ones who are doing really well in high school and there certainly are aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids who are out there killing it doing amazing things in high school against university but how do you bridge that gap to make up for that 12 years um of being neglected, basically. First of all, the, the, the kids who, who, who undertook the studies at UNSW of all um, varieties, you know, you know, the top students and um, to the ones that are not, not, not um, did, didn't have grade eight high school. So we cater for all of them. So that's the first thing. Uh, we've, we've actually uh, have been sponsored through the Australian Research Council, uh, you know, a major grant in actually studying uh, academic persistence in the unpreparedness of kids. So we've spent years and years looking at how to actually do that. Uh, and we've, we've developed these kind of um, schematics to try and um, capture the kind of work that really needs to be done from the kids without the records of school up to speed um, so they could participate well in the courses. And this is the kind of um, simple scaffold we use in terms of uh, acknowledging that the unprepared kids have a level of dependence that requires a lot of attendance, uh, particularly on the learning support issue. We've developed services around this as well, how to actually move in and not just attend to the, uh, the, uh, the dependence issue, but how to grow them, how to build that capacity so they are independent. So we have a lot of things that we've developed from the science that we've got around assistance. And <clears throat> we then took it to a practical sense, into a centre like uh, Neurogilly at UNSW, and we ordered all the services that were actually in place and ordered it back to the kind of scaffolds about how you move kids from dependency to, uh, to, to become independent learners and, and deal with their lack of preparedness. And then uh, we plotted them across the, the continuum so that we could be sure that we would be moving kids constantly through their course and attending to their needs before they have issues. And where there were lack of services, we actually developed services for that. So, so that is actually the, the, the way that we've dealt with those kids um, in getting through uh, to their courses. Um, so we didn't, do, we didn't ask any changes of the faculty. We didn't ask for cultural competency tests uh, and, and, and um, uh, training. Uh, we didn't argue for optional and Torres perspectives in the curriculum. We didn't really do uh, much around the kinds of stuff that you, you, the, the, the most universities do around the soft patronage of culture. We actually backed ourselves. Can we actually develop the service to actually help those kids getting through all of the kids, not just the one with the good OP scores, but all of the kids? And that's how we uh, came to this, uh, getting the great numbers that we've seen now in the last few years. And we did, um, and, and going forward, we've developed a whole lot of services to try and influence the kind of capacity beyond the school that we can actually do as a university and build it in a way that where we can actually be assured that there's some preparedness for university study outside of what the schools do. Yeah? So <clears throat> we weren't prepared just to sit back and accept the capacity that, uh, that the schools deliver to it, but could we influence this? And when I looked at all of the activities in the pre-entry um, stuff that we all universities do, they were largely recreational. There was no design in terms of building capacity of the kids. So <clears throat> these are the kinds of ways we're going forward now and adapting even, even the work that we've already done so far to actually give us a better start at, at, the, at the beginning point of the first year 
so that we could actually um, uh, be sure that we're not going to set them up to fail. Moreover, we've, we've looked at the kind of pipeline in, in forensic detail to understand actually what's really going in. There's a lot of stuff broken in the system, you know, that we have to fix. We get a lot of applications in, into uh, the universities, but we convert very small amounts of them. We, we, we leave them struggle in the first month of their course and attrition before census days is falling. And then, then we leave them in the courses and wait for them to fall over and the retention rate is not good. And onward goes to why we get uh, less than 50% completed. So we've forensically been working on that in the last couple of years. And if you plug in the kind of achievements we did at UNSW, that number really changes really radically. So in a regional university where they typically have something like 800 applications, they convert at 25%, that actually means 200 offers. Um, if they don't deal with attrition rate and they lose them at around 8%, the numbers deplete to 184. <clears throat> if you don't attend to the retention issue and you travel along at 60 to 70%, your numbers reduce to about 139. And if you have a completion rate of 45%, which, which it is now, um, you end up with 62. 800 to 62. So we've got issues that we have to deal with as an institution, as higher education institution, how you do with that. So if I plug in the work that we did at UNSW, we, we converted 60 plus percent of kids from application to enrollment. We reduced, in some years, the attrition rate to zero before census day. We raised the retention rate up to 80.3. So, you know, even if we then completed them at the same rate as a regional university, we would get quite a different outcome. We would treble the number of students. So what we're doing is really going through the process of the whole higher education experience to be able to work out ways to support all of our kids, not just the one with LP schools. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Philip. Um, I'm Helen Sage, I'm a GP from Adelaide. Uh, we have a mentoring group there of doctors who support Indigenous medical students. I'm so excited by your announcement today about trying to get more surgical trainees, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander surgical trainees. Why did you not announce this yesterday when there was a whole room full of people from other faculties to hear this? We announced this almost six months ago. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't know the structure of the meeting, but um, it's been out there for almost six months. So um, we're working through the process. So. Um, we do want to get the message out, yes. Kia ora. Um, Ravali Jensen, I'm the Chair of the Māori Medical Practitioners Association. My question's for the Italian gentleman from the AMA. <laughs> <laughs> and um, respectfully, I want to interrogate your assertion. And I want to go, is there any evidence for that? You've, you've said, you're calling for a national target to close a gap. And I'm asking, what's the evidence for doing that? Because it looks like you did it several years ago. That didn't help, just say. Um, thank you for your question. Um, look, I, I suppose on, on, on a number of levels, it makes a lot of empirical sense. So we know, you know and in fact, I know from my own cultural background, over as far back as the 70s the, and the early and the late 60s, the, the big improvements in, in health that was afforded to um, uh, migrant populations from Southeast Europe by having uh, culturally appropriate and, and, and generationally produced doctors from that part of the world. So, and they are now second or third generation in, in terms of um, in medical um, uh, you know, uh, outcomes, but a lot of the evidence has been repeatedly, sh uh, I would have thought, shown 
um, for, and called for not just by, by the AMA but by other parties and other bodies, including government, that acknowledges that. Now, to understand a, a person's particular cultural or, or heritage or background is to understand a lot of the the mixture, the, uh, the ingredients that go into producing illness and disease and to, to try and um, affect outcomes generally and long term without understanding the fabric and the background um, seems to me um, uh, counterintuitive on, on a personal level. So, um, but other than that, I, I don't have any of the evidence or the research with me here today that I uh, can, you know, underpin my assertions, but um, both at a, at a prima facie level and also, you know, commonsensically and from personal experience in my own uh, cultural background, it makes a lot of sense. And I know that it's drawing a very tenuous link between the Australia's First People and migrants from, you know, Southeast Europe. But um, uh, a, lo a lot of the, the same improvements and understanding of, uh, of illnesses that occurred in that um, cohort could be at a parallel to some extent and I don't even wish to begin to belittle the, the magnitude of the problems facing um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in any way. But I, I, I do seem to think that just at a, at a, prime, uh, at a primary evidence point of view it makes implicit sense to do, to understand that by bridging that gap and by bridging the number of doctors and subsequently medical students who can um, understand the you know the and relate particularly to um, their own uh, people, um, it makes the out outcomes will be more implicitly um, taken on and driven and changing. One of the core things that we do in general practice is that we try and influence behaviour of our patients. We try and do it incrementally and systematically, day by day by day. Now, if you're not, if you don't, if you're not able to connect with your patient, your ability to try and get your patient to change their their lifestyle um, is limited. We had the AHIW uh, figures released this week, and prevention, prevention, prevention was one of the key messages that it drove home. One in um, one in four Australians have a chronic disease. Uh, one in two Australians have a chronic disease and one in four have more than one chronic disease. And so prevention is really key to, um, uh, um, to try and reverse change um, those outcomes. And I wouldn't have thought that anywhere more particularly um, in understanding uh, and, and trying to get a message across in prevention is the idea of being uh, culturally relevant, relevant and, uh, and appropriate and safe. That answers your question. So one more question under the action. Um, yeah, my name's Shannon Springer. I'm an Aboriginal GP that goes to Charles. I was going to see those statistics up there. Um, first of all, I'd like to just make a comment um, about uh, with Chris. Uh, Chris, um, you know, I think your journey so far has been a, a true epitome of the theme of the conference. You know, um, your journey has been one of strength and resilience, so I acknowledge you for that. Um, and you're a true leader for us all. Uh, my question is um, to both yourself and uh, Lyndall. Um, with the model of the ideas van, has it lent itself to um, other areas, for example, cardiology, um, you know, developing um, ways of doing stress echoes in rural remote areas? Um, because um, you know, getting access to diagnostic investigations in these places is, is quite difficult as well. And um, I guess my next question is to uh, Mr. Truscott. Since embarking on your reconciliation action plan for your college, how has that um, influenced or um, changed the environment of the college? Um, because we, uh, I sort of make the assertion that embarking on such a process like this actually improves the medical profession. Um, yeah, so just interested in both of those responses. Um, thank, thank you for your question, Shannon. It's been a long time since we've talked. Um, 
there is a cardiology assessment van, is that the right name? It's an assessment van that does stress echoes, etc. at the moment. I understand it's a private model, um, but uh, certainly um, it's making its way around. The, the hardest thing with, with these mobile um, models is it doesn't fit into any particular funding line in a federal government way or in a state government way. And, and so they might use $30 million to bring a group of doctors around and fly them in and out. But coming up with $5 million uh, to see, uh, you know, 2,000 people in two years and yet you still have a unit that's going to last for another 10, um, it, that there's, there's, it doesn't correlate anywhere, and and this is this is the problem. Uh, we've been very lucky in that uh, we were given five million dollars for two years. Um, I uh, was lucky to have twenty one partners, including Mr. Volvo, who gave us the truck, um, and we've been able to stretch that funding for four years. But I can assure you, we're still going to have to find. Uh, the money to run. But let me say to you this, that it will cost about 800000 a year to run our little van and do treatments worth millions of dollars uh, for about $200 a patient. So if you were the Prime Minister, where would you put the money? And, and, and I, say, I, think, I, think this is, I think this is the challenge. This, this is the challenge of getting this old-fashioned um, idea to move with the times, literally. Does that answer you? Uh, Sean, thank you for that question. Um, someone once said, um, strategy eats culture for lunch. And uh, you may be aware that the college at the moment has embarked on a major program uh, because of, of an accusation which in many ways was correct of discrimination, bullying and sexual harassment. Uh, we've spent about $1.5 million on the program at the moment and that's a pretty big effort from a, uh, a small group of 7,000 people who are funding it. Uh, we've developed a complaints process which I think is, is going to really underscore it all or underpin it where any member of the public or anyone indeed can complain to the college about any action that their fellows may make. Part of this is relating to building respect and improving patient safety. We know that if patients are treated in a disrespectful environment, uh, then their outcomes are worse. So uh, in answer to your question, we're doing as much as we can. We're putting all our resources into it at the moment. Uh, and I can't tell you how we're going yet because it's been too soon because we are talking culture. Uh, but there is a very, very strong commitment from the college uh, to, to do these things, which includes Diversity is part of that. So I would like to thank our uh, presenters for t turning up today, taking time out of their busy schedule to uh, share with the audience um, and, and their, their support and their, um, with Aboriginal uh, people. So let's put our hands together again.